Golf Central on YouTube, brought to you by the Chrome Soft Golf Ball from Callaway. Hi again, everyone. I'm Jimmy Roberts, and this is your Golf Central update. On the PGA Tour, Seamus Power wins the Bermuda Championship, earning his second career win. He bogeyed four of the last six holes, but mixes in a pair of birdies during that stretch as well. Ben Griffin surrendered the lead on the back nine, but his third place finish, still a great story considering he gave up golf 18 months ago before returning. For Power, a $1.2 million paycheck and also playing status on tour now, safe for two years. Off the course, Live Golf has been the biggest story in the sport all year long. On the course, the Breakaway Tour wrapped up its eighth tournament season this past weekend at Doral. The team event was won by the four aces, the squad captain by Dustin Johnson. The $16 million prize split four ways among Johnson, Taylor Gooch, Pat Perez, and Patrick Reed. And with that, we welcome in our Rex Hoggard, who was at Doral this past week. So, Rex, uh, now that you've had a little bit of time to digest what you saw, what were your overall impressions down there in Miami? Jimmy, I do think it's interesting when you refer to the experiment, because really, I think in a lot of guys' eyes, that's exactly what it was. I remember talking with Phil Mickelson earlier in the week last week, him pointing out that really six or seven months ago, it was hard to wrap your mind around how Live Golf was going to get from that concept, which was at the time just kind of something written down on paper, to to rile that team championship, all the money you just got through talking about. There was a sense of accomplishment. I will say this. I... I think it made me realize how fractured the game actually is because for the majority of the summer we have spent covering the PGA Tour, those players who remained loyal to the PGA Tour. But in this particular case, you got an idea of how entrenched the players were on the other side. I was taken, how many players told me that, that not only are Live Golf events going to get world ranking points, but they're going to get world ranking points starting next year, that they're also going to have a domestic television rights deal in place. All of these things that we're talking about that need to fall into place Everyone felt like it was going to happen next year, and you don't get that from the other side. And I, I think it gives you an idea of there's really not much middle ground between what's going on in golf right now. All right. Well, all of that remains to be seen. You talk about the television deal. The fact of the matter is a lot of people may have heard about this, but not an awful lot of people have seen this. So let's start there. What were the crowds like? Well, on Friday, it was it was quiet earlier in the morning. I think as the noon tea times, as the shotgun starts started, started to come out, more and more people did. Now, this was a, a bit of a strange comparison, Jimmy, because as you know, the PGA Tour had been at Doral for decades. It had been one of the longest stops on the PGA Tour. It had become sort of an event in and of itself, and it was not that. I think that's what they're going for, and there's still maybe a, an element of the unknown when it comes to these particular uh, events. I did talk to some players and some caddies who talked about the crowds at certain stops, like I think the Portland stop. Everyone felt like there was a lot of people there. I think the, the stop outside of Boston, they felt like a lot of fans showed up. The Miami market, though, was a little bit different, by, for sure. All right, well, much has been made about uh, players being restricted as to who they can talk to. Did you have any problem talking to anybody? I did not, Jimmy. I mean, I think you and I both have done this for about 20 years, and I think the access was pretty much the same. I think I probably talked to at least a dozen guys if not more, and because I did want to get sort of a wide range of exactly what this experience has been like. But no, there were no restrictions whatsoever. Now, during the press conferences, the way they do their press conferences kind of as teams, that sort of makes it difficult maybe to ask certain type of questions that are probably better in a one-on-one -on -one setting. But no, there aren't any restrictions. All right, you, you mentioned the team element. Let's go there. want to talk about that. Something that Live Golf seems to be staking a lot of their existence on. In a sport that values individuality, did you get a sense that the players are buying into the, uh, the team aspect aside from winning and getting an enormous amount of money? I think from the business side of it, they have. I think there's an economic issue involved here. And if you look at what you just mentioned, Dustin Johnson's team, they had a really, really successful year. And it's not hard to see that success on the ledger. You can see how much money they made. And a lot of the players I talked to talked about going into next year when you have a set schedule. I actually saw kind of a tentative schedule of what they're looking to do with those 14 events. And you can also sort of set the teams in stone as opposed to what they've been this year. It's kind of been a moving target. And the idea is that each team would be able to trade amongst themselves. So think of it as a transaction, that if someone is on DJ's team, 
and Ian Poulter wants him on his team, then it's going to be some sort of transaction that we see in other sports. I think that interests players a lot because you do want to be on one of those successful teams. We can see how much that's worth, but this is still very much a new concept. So even though I think it's resonating with the players and the people with Live Golf, I think it's probably going to take some time before the fans fully understand it. Rex, you mentioned that you have covered an awful lot of golf over the years after being there in person. Did you change any of your opinions about this series? It didn't really change the opinions about this series. I will say that one of the stories I wanted to go down and work on, and we've heard sort of anecdotally about how this has fractured relationships between longtime friends, players on the PGA Tour mm -hmm. who ended up going to live that aren't friends with those players who remained on the PGA Tour. And we've seen it. I talked with Graham McDowell a few weeks ago about the idea that those relationships just aren't the same. He didn't mention Roy McIlroy by name, but we know how close those two were. And, and it's obvious they're on both sides of this ledger, and they're not probably spending a lot of time texting back and forth. And I got that from a lot of players. I, I think there is an element to this that there are fractured relationships that probably will never be the same. I was also taken by the idea that I asked a number of players that if the opportunity ever arose, that they could come back to the PGA Tour, that maybe some sort of uh, compromise was reached between Liv Goff and the PGA Tour, would they consider it? I was surprised how many players told me they would not, Jimmy. Interesting. All right. So uh, with the first Liv season now complete, I guess the million or maybe it's a billion dollar question is, what's next? Well, I mentioned the schedule going into next year, it's, it's going to be those 14 events. It's going to be what they planned all along, and it's going to be with the team set. I think the next thing to talk about is the world ranking, which we've already discussed. Everyone on live, including the executives, know how important that is, that they get this resolved as quickly as possible, although I can't imagine that's going to be resolved anytime soon. There's also the domestic television rights deal that comes into play, and I think there's another element that Live Golf wants to sell each of these teams as an individual franchise. Think of it as an NFL team, that each of the owners is sort of part of the larger collective. That's probably the next big hurdle that they're going to have to overcome because that's the only way, and some officials talked about this Saturday morning at the Row. This is one of the biggest ways, maybe the only way, they can become economically viable. All right, so much we have seen and heard about Live Golf to this point, but great to finally get a first-hand account. Rex, thanks so very much. So... Looking ahead to next year, we are still waiting for official word from the majors on what could happen with players who have left for Live Golf. Over the weekend, RNA Chief Executive Martin Slumbers tipped his hand as to what the Open Championship would do in 2023. In an interview with Golf Digest, Slumbers said, We will go public in January or February with what we are going to do with regard to Live Golfers, but if you want a guide, Go back to what I said in July. We are not banning anyone. We are not going to betray 150 years of history and have the open not be open. The name says it all, and that's important. What we will do is ensure that there are appropriate pathways and ways to qualify. I'm looking forward to seeing Cam Smith tee it up around 9.40 a.m. on the first day of the open next year. The Open needs to set itself aside from what's going on in terms of disagreements and make sure we stay true to our principle, which is to have the best players in the world competing.